Weeks. Thank you so much today for joining me on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Happy to be here. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's super cool, but I think uh, I've met most of my recent guests on, on Twitter, and, uh, and I'm just going to add you to that list. Uh, you are like a seriously inspiring guy. Um, I know you've, you've had a lot of changes in your life over the last few years, and, and I'm sure you know many people are excited to hear like how you got there, how you did it, and um, looking forward to sort of you know teasing that out in this podcast. But so excellent. There, there was a tweet that you recently wrote, and I, I like it uh, a lot. Um, and there's 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 also many ways we could start this podcast, but I think this actually draws out a lot of almost your story and and how you got to where you are. So you said that in last December you you did this tool called the the time traveling tool, right? And I was wondering if you could maybe just sort of tell people a little bit about that tool, like what it is, um, because I think it's it's a great thing for many people to actually do themselves. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to pull that tweet out of all of them. Um, it's just something when I'm sitting around, I'd like to visualize me being 80 years old or, you know, further down in my life and looking back at my life and at the present moment. So I visualize myself being basically in an old folks home, looking back to the day when I had my kids or when where I am currently right now. And I just think about what I should be doing. Am I sitting there on my phone? Am I ignoring my kids or am I taking advantage of the time that I have right now? And that's really, it's that simple. I just take the moment, I think about it. I go, okay, if I could look back and I had to do anything different, what should I be doing? And uh, it just kind of puts it into a perspective of wasting time, taking advantage of what we do have and appreciating what you really do have at, in the moment. Cause uh, I think it's easy to be stuck online, looking at all these people doing all these great things. They're show only showing you the highlights and you kind of just, uh, you're not living in the moment. So it's been a tool that I use to really help me live in the moment. And you wrote like quite extensively on it. Um, and you, you specifically in this one, you, you spoke about, the amount of hours that you spent watching sports, mm -hmm. which was crazy. I was just going over this with my weed free group the other day on how to extract things. Um, in that example, you're talking about the time watching sports, but in the one yesterday, we were talking about how much we spent on weed a month and it was $400. Was it four? Yeah. Four to $600 a month. I was spending, it turned out to be $7,200 a year. It adds up so quick, you don't really look at it. Same with the hockey, same with the baseball. When you are sitting in every night for two or three hours a night, it turns into a part-time job just sitting around watching other guys chase their dreams. You get hypnotized into the TV, into your favorite sports character, into the, the whole story of it, and you start living staring at a TV. And it's easy to just enjoy it every night to tell yourself, oh, I worked hard all day. I'm going to have a beer and watch the game. And I got to know the score so I can talk about it tomorrow with the boys. And you get lost in the bigger picture of how many hours does it actually take to watch every game a year? So it ends up being hundreds of hours, days, months out of your life that when you look back at it, is that what you want to be spending your time really doing is watching other men chase their dreams. So laying it out like that into a different perspective, I think can help guys maybe skip a couple of those important hockey games. I remember when I was in the thick of watching sports, I would leave family events early. I don't care if it was boxing day, my birthday, I would leave dinner. I would go home just so I could watch the sports game uninterrupted, crack beer, drink, yell at my TV. I, don't look back. I don't, I don't regret those times. You know, there's positive sports things, sports and entertainment can play in our lives. But uh, I was addicted to sports as much as any other drug or alcohol. And uh, it, it became a time drain and um, getting rid of that, taking a time audit of my life and what I was doing was a big part of me turning my life around.
you said something that it was like 25 days a year in total. Like, I mean, that's crazy when you think like, you know, you, I mean, it's, it's just a ridiculous amount of time, isn't it? Like watching sports. Um, and, in, in, in a 10 year period, that would be a full year wow. of your life watching sports on TV. And then it's not just the sports. I mean, then you're adding in those commercials in there. And they're brainwashing you, pharmaceutical companies, beer companies, buy my truck, buy my beer, buy this, buy that. You don't notice it, but it's it's affecting you. Yeah, it's it's this trap, isn't it? Hmm. And it's a vicious cycle. It, it is a vicious cycle, but and you said that you actually went um cold turkey then after that from from sports. Like you literally were like, Okay, cool, this is enough for me to realize I'm done. I wanted to spend my time doing better things than, than what I was doing. And uh, there was a big part of my life growing up that I never watched sports. It was when I turned about 18 or 19 years old and started going to college. And it just became the thing that all the boys did before hockey or, you know, we'd watch the game on Friday nights. And then it turned into, oh, this is my favorite team. Oh, they're playing tonight and they're playing Thursday night and they're playing Friday night. And then there's an afternoon game on Saturday and it started dictating my schedule. And I think a lot of people are like that. And I think um, you don't realize it, but you start living vicariously through entertainment. And I don't think that's what we're meant here to be. Yeah, exactly. It's it, And it's like, it, it literally is an addiction, isn't it? I mean, people people might think addictions are, you know, say like drugs or alcohol or whatever, but but addiction comes in, in many different forms. And, you know, sitting on your couch, flicking channels and watching sports is, is, is a, is a pretty bad addiction. I'd have uh, I'd have a ritual as well before every hockey game. I had to pound a beer, so I. And then as the puck dropped, and if I didn't crack it right as the puck dropped, you know my team wasn't gonna have the best luck. So you you'd pound a beer and then you'd crack another, and then you're on to three beer before it's even done. You know, and I was drinking nine, ten, eleven beer every night waking up the next morning and looking at the counter and just going ashamed, you know, I'd wake up and I'd throw all the empties out before the wife got up and then I'd go to work all day and come home and you do the same fucking thing over and over again. And, uh, I just had enough of it. I'm glad I did. Yeah, but it's, it's definitely a vicious, vicious cycle. That's for sure. So you, you touched on it now, like you used to be this massive drinker. Um, you know, you obviously through sports, but also like you said, sometimes you would just come home from work and you'd already be on like your third beer. Um, what, 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 like, what else kind of like, if anything made you kind of go, okay, cool. I've just got to stop this besides say your time travel tool and, and other things. You know, deep down if you're drinking too much and it never affected my work i'd wake up every day i'd go to work um i'm in construction so we're building homes and oftentimes at two o'clock in the afternoon the boys would sneak a beer before the boss was you know back from break or we'd uh then we'd sit around at the end of the day and there's normally the customer who's so happy to have you out there building their homes they bring us cold beer so then you have a couple beer before you go home and it's it's pretty normal up here. I don't know about where you're at, but it's just part of our culture where it's, you know, you're drinking beer everywhere you go. And then you stop by the beer store before you go home. You'd have one on the way home. And then you get home like there was many days I was four or five deep before walking in my door at night. And then you have another six at home and you tell yourself, oh, I only had six beer, but you know, you had three at work and one on the ride. And sometimes you're stopping by the bar with a buddy too. So, I, when I tell people how much beer I drank, I was probably underestimating it. I tell people normally about a hundred beer a week. That's probably on the low end of things most, most weeks. So, uh, I just had enough. Um, I was wondering, I, knew- I was wondering, Jeremy, um, when you change your life so much and you sort of stop drinking and you stop these bad habits, uh, often, your mates don't really understand. Have you found that that's been the case for you? So I don't know how much of the uh, weed free 2024 group you've been following. Yeah, lots uh, of it. 
on on January 1st, I took my stash of marijuana and I threw it all on a bonfire. It was my goal just to not smoke weed this year. Um, I've been doing really good these past three years. You've been following along. I run ultra marathons. I, I wake up in the morning. I, I run. I've started my own business. I always told myself weed wasn't holding me back. Um, and for lots of parts, it wasn't. But I wanted to challenge myself this year with getting rid of it. So, And then that sparked 100 people joining my weed free group. And we built this community of uh, people just looking to get after it this year. But that's one of the biggest problems people have is you are going to lose friends when you start changing. I noticed it with alcohol and sports, and I noticed it with weed. Not, not so much weed, because I've lost most of my friends that were just there for the good time friends, I call them. And, um, you know, that is a big challenge. If you're going to, if you really want to make change, you're going to end up losing some of your friends. And they say you're the five people you spend the most time around. So if you want to change, you're going to have to change who you hang around. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to ditch them completely. It just means that, you know, on Friday nights when the boys are going to be drinking beer, well, if you want to wake up Saturday morning and go for your long run, you're going to be missing out those Friday nights. And they're not going to give a shit. They don't fucking care, you know. They're going to find another guy to bring a case of beer and some weed, and, and they're just going to keep doing their things. Um, you want to inspire some of those guys to join your side, but it's it's hard. One of my buddies going in, uh, with the challenge this year is really battling it right now. He's uh, He's had a lot of his childhood friends attack him saying oh you're all of a sudden a fitness influencer you remind us of uh this girl from our hometown and you're trying too hard and they're uh it's like a bucket full of crabs when one crab tries to escape the other crab's going to be trying to pull you right back down um and this gentleman i'm talking about right now he told me for the past two years he hated when i posted all my runs on social media because it made him feel like shit. He was sitting on the couch, being lazy, drinking beer. He didn't hate that I was going after it. It just made him feel like he wasn't going after it. So if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna be vocal online and share your, 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 um, your development, you're gonna have a lot of people in your past not happy with it. And it's gonna make them feel insecure. And um, they're, you're going to lose friends. You're getting, it's, it's part of it. But on the other end of it, I've met people like you. I was going through your podcast list. You had uh, Chris, one of the bros on and JB and all these guys. If you put yourself out there, you're going to attract your new tribe. Shout out to tribal training. You know, you're going to find the people that motivate you. You're going to find the five people that will make you succeed in life. Surround yourself with those people instead of your old friends that are trying to keep you down. I always think like one of the best ways to lead is just through action. So if you, you know, people don't like to be told what to do, right? But if you actually change your own way of doing things, that's a great way to get other people to do too. Because either you like, they're like, okay, cool. Well, see you later, Jeremy. I don't want to be your mate anymore because, you know, you're not part of the boys group anymore. Or they're like, you, they're like, hmm. I should be doing that. You know, I want to do it. And they come and speak to you on the side and they're like, Hey man, can you just, you know, help me out a little bit? How did it get going and stuff? And leading through action for me is the best way. It doesn't matter what it is, where it is. That's just the way, just be the change you want to see. And and people will follow that, that want to follow, you know? I, uh, I really couldn't believe the, um, the group of people that took to my quitting weed post. I wasn't expecting it at all. You know, I just thought it would kind of stick within our little tribe of people on the internet and a couple of people might join me. And I've had people from all around the world now, they're South Africa, all over Europe. We're all in this group chat together. We're all battling the same, the same things, the friendships, the, you know, the, the hard times and the trying to be better. Um, some guys are having a real hard time. We're all starting to dream again. I'd like to touch upon that. And, uh, that's the biggest, when I quit smoking weed in 2002, I did a sober October for a month and 
I started to have these vivid dreams. And so I researched it more and the weed actually suppresses your REM sleep. And so for the past year, I've been thinking about how weed has made me stop dreaming at night. And I call it the weed crusher or the dream crusher. And so for a year, I thought about how when I stopped smoking weed, I started to dream again. And there's just something so important there that, yeah, you might be feeling good and smoking dope, but you're killing your dreams. And so I thought about that for a year and that's when I decided I'm going to take 2024 off. And, and yeah, it just, it, it blew up that my first post got almost a half a million views, which my posts don't get half a million views too often. So uh, I still, even this morning, I woke up to three more guys in my DM saying, Hey, I'm struggling with quitting weed. I want to quit smoking weed. Can I join your group? Can you help me out? And uh, I wasn't expecting to lead a group of a hundred people to, uh, to trying to quit fucking smoking weed this year, but here I am and uh, I'm doing my best. I'm not really a, a counselor or anything like that. So uh, it's a big learning curve for me as well, but it's been fun. That's sensational, man. A hundred people that that's a, that's a big task, you know, and, and like you said, you're going to learn so much just from, you know, being the sort of front man of, of all of this. What, what have, what have your learning experiences been so far? People need a community, men need a community, men need someone to talk to, to be open to. And sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger about the hard times you're going through. We just need to support. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned so far is that lots of these guys just need a tribe, especially how we touched upon. You're going to lose some of those friends that I don't want to say they're holding you back. I don't have any resentment on the guys that still drink every night. Uh, they're just living a different life than you want to live. Um, so I always struggle with, you know, talking negative about my old group of friends. If any of you guys are watching this, I fucking love you all still to have a beer for me. I'm not judging you. It just wasn't for me anymore. Um, but as far as learning, I, I'm still taking it as it comes and I'm just trying to be a good support and um, share my resources. Um, I've met a lot of cool people in these past two, three years with sports development. I'm part of the 100 Club, so there's all sorts of people that I've learned from off of there. Um, so lots of it's just getting people into contact with the right type of people and having them surround themselves with, with new people in their lives who are going to motivate them as opposed to just keep them complacent. Yeah, for sure, man. No, that's, that's great. Um, I like what you also said there about one of the lessons where sometimes people need like almost a stranger to speak to their, speak to them about their problems. Um, it's just like, it's easier like that sometimes, isn't it? You know, rather than trying to admit to your, your people that are close in your life. And the people close in your life are going to try to protect you. I don't hold back when someone comes for advice to me i don't owe them nothing they don't owe me nothing i'm coming as an outsider and i'm just i'm gonna tell you how it is um i had a gentleman last night kind of he's trying to quit weed and he's going through a divorce that he doesn't want to go through but his wife wants to go through and i told him my opinion on divorces and i'm a kid from a divorced family and it it, it wrecks you it wrecks your family and um he didn't want to hear those things i don't think but i'm gonna tell him that was my experience and you know, do everything you can to keep your family together. I think that's the most important thing. And I think that's a big part of what we see in the world. There's a lot of men out there that didn't try hard enough to keep their families together. And you don't blame the man. You don't blame the woman. I get it. But it's as a society, we need to do better to keep these families together. It's, uh, it's important. And I feel like we've lost it in our society. I think that's a, that's a great thing to mention because it's almost like it's too easy now, you know, like, okay, cool. Well, you know what? We just get divorced and I'll go find another chick or another guy and uh, we'll move on, you know, but they, there's always this collateral damage, especially when you have kids. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm also from a, from a divorce family and, and it's just not nice for the kids, you know, like now your life is split in two. It's like, you know, it's a shock when you're a kid. Um, shock and you're gonna everyone's gonna play each other off the other person and start having good guys and bad guys and you're gonna I don't know just leave there's nothing good there's nothing good in divorce and 
I know there's situations where it has to happen, but if we could reduce it just a little bit and have people fight a little bit harder for their families and understand that it might feel like it's the right thing, but it's not the right thing for the kids. It's the right thing for you in the mm -hmm. moment. And it's pretty selfish. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that. I just wanted to t touch on the, on the, the dreams a little bit that you said, like what, what is, what has changed with your dreams since you stopped smoking weed? Going back to 2002, when I did the Sober October, um, it was, uh, sorry, this is a little hard to talk about, but uh, it was right when we found out, uh, we found out around middle September that our uh, baby girl wasn't developing kidneys and that she wasn't going to uh, be compatible with life. So my wife was about six months pregnant with our second child. We knew she was a girl already. We were very excited because uh, we've been, you know, just excited to build our family. And so uh, that first month that I quit smoking weed as a challenge, I started to dream again. These crazy dreams, nightmares almost. It was pretty hard time. Um, I kept on dreaming that I couldn't find my vehicle. We go out to a beach or a movie or the mall and afterwards I couldn't find my vehicle now you can analyze these dreams about being lost and all that that's not what I want to get into it was just the fact that I had these vivid dreams every night and I wasn't sure if it was because I was going through grief dealing with the loss well she was still pregnant so we hadn't lost yet but you know we knew it was happening um, so we went through all that and then all last year, I just kept thinking. And then, so I started smoking weed again after we had our child and we lost her. Um, and I quit dreaming, quit dreaming again. So for all the last year, I just kept on thinking in my head how the weed has been suppressing my dreams. And that was probably the biggest part of why I wanted to run this year without marijuana in it. Um, and yeah, I quit smoking in January 1st and a couple days right on cue, I started to dream vivid dreams again, waking up, remembering all the details in the dreams. They're wild. They don't make sense. But every morning I'm waking up going, oh, I'm dreaming again. And man, that's so, so powerful. It's so important to have those dreams. It's your brain processing your day, storing memories. It's your subconscious at work. It's, it's, it's everything. And so if anyone's watching this thinking about Quentin Weed, I, I recommend it. You, you'll start dreaming again. And there's just something so important there that uh, that we're missing out on when we're having the conversation about marijuana. Yeah, bud. Um, yeah, dreams are one of those things. It's like they're just so difficult to see. To, to are they like like who really knows you know you have people that do analyze them and they say well if this if you see this then that's what it means and it's like does it really like it's this weird thing that happens um while we're sleeping um i was just wondering but like you you mentioned that you lost your daughter nova nova lynn if i'm correct with the name um what, what exactly happened there you said her lungs weren't developing uh it was her kidneys, kidneys uh sorry. I believe it's called a, ge a genesis. There's a proper name for it. Um, and in September 22, our, our, our doctor knew that she might have one, might have two. Um, you can, they'll, they'll, they'll proceed with the pregnancy if, if it has one. Um, it's very unlikely positive results. Um, so we kind of had an inkling early September and we got spent, sent to a specialist and they confirmed that our baby just wasn't developing any kidneys at all um, and that you can't make it without, without kidneys, right? So um, they at that time recommended just termination of the pregnancy, um, but that's not the route my wife wanted to go. And God bless her for fucking choosing the path that she took. We uh, carried it until it was she. She carried our baby until it was safe to deliver. And uh, 
she delivered our little angel Nova and we got to spend five minutes with her. She took her first and last breaths on our chests. And, uh, you know, it's every parent's worst, worst fucking nightmare. Um, and I, I shared that story with the, uh, with social media and it's amazing who will reach out to you and share similar stories, how strong people really are, how most people are holding it back. Everyone's dealt with losses. I'm not going to sit here and pretend my loss was harder than anyone else's. People are losing kids at three years old. They've spent three years with their child and they're fucking losing their kids. This shit happens every day. Um, I'm grateful for the time I had with her, but uh, people have it much harder than what we went through. Not that it wasn't hard for us. It was fucking devastating. Um, but uh, it was the hardest shit we've went through. And then we, uh, we knew we were going to keep having kids. We have dreams of a big family. So we just had our, our third child, Tucker. But dealing with that pregnancy now, after you've lost one, it was the most stressful nine months every day. You're just, every appointment, you're scared. It's going to be the same thing right up until the last minute. And our, our little man, Tucker, came four weeks early. So I was at work on a Sunday, and I got the phone call. I'm going to the hospital, and, man, you just, every worry in the world starts coming back to you. You know, oh, no, it's early, and you've already dealt with all the trauma. It just kind of flashes back into you, but... He came out healthy and happy and everything was great. So um, here we are now. He's five weeks old and it's been great. But that's so cool about Tucker. I, but I can only imagine the, the grief that you that you suffer with, with Nova, you know, and also how smoking the weed maybe like almost suppressed some of the grief because you, you know, you haven't been able to to dream but also i guess you know it's been a bit of maybe a distraction on on occasions you know and uh I, I, like i wonder if now like because you're quitting and everything is going to be this sort of flood of emotions this year while you maybe process that a bit more and having tucker that's that was a big reason why i didn't smoke weed in october i had every excuse in the world to say i'm not doing sober october i'm just going to keep staying high i'm sad i'm you know i woe was me I didn't want that, and that's why I stuck with it, the original Sober October. And, yeah, I was probably self-medicating all the last year to suppress some of that, but I try to grieve a little bit every day. Whenever I go out on my runs, I kind of talk to my baby girl, Nova, and so that kind of gives me a little bit, you know, how I, I run lots, so there's probably four or five times a week I'm out there for a couple minutes on my trails having a little cry and speaking to my angel and, hoping that she's proud of her dad. And uh, so I've grieved. I tried to grieve a little bit every day yeah, instead of holding it all in. Um, as far as this year goes and the weed free, I'm in such a good place that it hasn't been, well, I haven't felt any more grieving. Um, but it's hard also when you see your little guy and then you start thinking about, Oh, there's supposed to be three of us here, and oh, he's he's also a rem reminder of the hard times, but he's also um, a good reminder of how good we do have it as well. Um, there's lots of people who would give anything to have a couple healthy baby boys in their life, right? A lot of people have lost their both kids or or aren't able to have any kids and want to have kids. So um, we're very grateful for what we do have, and so I try to be appreciative of of how lucky we really are but thank you so much for sharing that uh i just can't even begin to imagine the the pain that you you gone through you know like i'm a dad to a daughter and just hearing i, it, I, I love your i love your bike rides and sun sunrise with your daughter man it's it's special to see you guys out there in the morning it's mm. really cool thanks but i appreciate it too like ah you know especially like just hearing stories like that now i'm like just do it every single day as much as you can, you know, spend as much time together. There's, there's, you just never, ever get these moments and this time back. So, you know, I, I just want to encourage all fathers and obviously mothers too, just to just make the most of your time with your kids. Eh? It, uh, I always think about her 
looking down on me and I want to make her proud. I don't want her dad being feeling sorry for himself. I couldn't imagine being up there looking down and, you know, feeling like you were responsible for this broken man. So uh, that drives me every day is trying to make her proud, n not not failing, trying to be the best father I can for my boys, but also for her who's watching me every day. So she's uh, she's a lot of my motivation as well. Well, you make all of us proud, bud, as your online mates, as your mates that have met you as well, of course, in, in person. So um, I have no doubt that you, you're you making her proud every single day with, with what you're doing because you you're definitely changing guys' lives and you, you, you're changing more guys' lives than you probably realize through just what you're doing, you know, just, there's so many people that like are watching, but don't ever say anything. And I think your reach is massive. So keep it up, bud. I appreciate that, man. You wrote a while ago, you said, I loved booze. So I quit. I love smoking. So I quit. I loved weed. So I quit. I hate the cold. So I embrace it. I hate running. So I do it. Um, I was just wondering, like, did, um, this where did this motivation like come from to to do these things if we haven't spoken about it already and like how did you slip into these bad habits like was it all of a sudden or just it happened over time it was pretty all of a sudden when i was younger um i think you get to choose your path at a young age and I remember being in grade six or seven year or grade six or seven. So, you know, 10 or 11 years old. And we were sneaking beer into elementary school and cigarettes and smoking them behind the dugouts, hiding in the bush, drinking, smoking. By the time I got to high school and I was a young high school kid, I was 13. My first year of high school, I got suspended the first month of school for smoking marijuana at school. A bunch of us got caught. One kid got sick and, one of the kids told on all of us anyways we all got caught so i've been on this path since i was a young age and it's it's pretty sociably acceptable up here just to be drinking at a young age um, parents let us do it not my parents i had to lie to my parents all the time um, but you always had a buddies who parents didn't care we would drink beer at their house and smoke weed at their house and it's it's normalized up here it's I, I still see the high school kids getting drunk every weekend and and that's where it starts i mean sure you're just gonna start on the weekend but that's not how it finishes it it turns into you drinking three nights a week then it goes to four nights a week and then you're drinking fucking vodka for breakfast and it, it's a slippery slope but it starts at a very young age and we tell these things, oh, I love smoking. Oh, I need a cigarette. And oh, my cigarette with my coffee in my morning is my favorite one. Or a cigarette after sex is the best. And you just, you, 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 you convince yourself that you need these things, that you love these things. Oh, I love beer. I love drinking. And it's the story that you tell yourself. And it's impossible to quit smoking if you're just going to continue to tell yourself that story. You got to change it. Or else you got to be pretty strong and realize, oh, these things that I like are actually killing me. Um, and then as far as the discipline and the doing hard things, I think my man, uh, David Goggins, inspired uh, the entire world there. And Jocko, Jocko Wilnick is one of my biggest uh, guys I go to. His book, Extreme Extreme Ownership, Ownership. Yeah. Changed, changed my life a couple of years ago. I just went... I've had enough of this shit. I need to start owning my shit and everything around me. And that was uh, those two guys. I try not to, you know, not read every single book. And I think if you if you do that, you kind of get lost in the self-help stuff. You just got to pick one, take the philosophy, buckle down. And uh, so that's what I did. I, uh, I started owning my shit and realizing that I wanted more for my family. We've always been, you know, middle class at best and i wanted more always wondering why i'm so poor why i'm living paycheck to paycheck you've got to start looking at yourself and realizing that you're you're spending 500 bucks a month on booze and cigarettes and it adds up and so I just started to own my shit and uh it's we're in a better spot now after a couple of years of it than i've ever been in my life and i feel like i'm just getting started
What has your wife's reaction been to your change? This is good because one of the guys I'm coaching right now, he's just kind of going through it with his wife. And uh, so me and my wife have been talking more about it now, looking back at how she felt. Because, you know, she married a man who smoked weed every day, drank every day, smoked cigarettes, didn't have much ambition, was happy floating by. And she just couldn't believe it. She uh, she just sat back and couldn't believe it. Um, I still think some morning she thinks I'm crazy when I'm getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and going running. Um, but she's the best. She's been nothing but supportive for me. And that's, uh, that's a big part of this. If you don't have someone, you know, being supportive for you, it's, uh, it's not going to work. You got to be a team and you got to be doing it for each other. And oh, she's been, uh, she's been my number one fan. She pushes me and makes me better. And she's, uh, also the reason I started my own contracting business. I couldn't do it without her. She's, uh, she's my number one. She's my best friend. So, uh, I owe her lots. That's cool. Did your wife have like any bad habits like herself that she's also gone, you know what, I'm going to just stop now too? Uh, she was a smoker as well. So we battled that together and um, I had more success with her at the start. But uh, as soon as she got pregnant, it was all over for her. You know, she had a proper reason to do it. So um, it was easy for her, but she was a, a weed smoker as well. We were, our first date was April 20th, 420. For all the stoners out there, it's the day you celebrate marijuana. So we also got married on 420, which is, you know, just shows you how much we loved smoking weed. Um, but she quit smoking weed as well when we had kids. I just kept going and uh, she had no problem with quitting. It wasn't, she became a mom and that's that's her thing now, not smoking weed, right? So uh, it was a uh, much harder for me to give up as as the man of the house, but uh, I'm glad I did. And so we were always honest with our kids. I wouldn't hide drinking from my kids. I wasn't going to hide smoking dope from our, my little guy, right? So I would roll joints and he would see me and I would say, I'm going to smoke a joint. And so I asked him yesterday, um, what do you think about daddy no longer smoking joints? And he said, um, I'm happy, dad. You have more time to play with me now. And that pretty much secured me never smoking weed again for the rest of my life. I know it's a year long challenge, but I'm not looking back at this point, man. We only have so much time with these, uh, with our kids and I'm not going to spend any of it high anymore. So I, uh, I can that, imagine that your heart, much... I can imagine your heart dropped a little bit when you said that. Yeah. Yeah, it did. So, wow. yeah, but, um, what is your what is your main bit of advice then for say guys that are are, are trying to quit weed or or I don't know if it crosses over into other things like booze and stuff too is it, is there like a main thing that you recommend? Learn to keep your word to yourself. It's easy to give your friends your word and show up. Hey, yeah, I'll, I'll be there on Friday morning for you to help you move, help you roof. You do those things because you're a man of your word and you have honor and integrity. But we have a hard time telling ourselves these things and staying true to ourselves. I see a lot of guys saying, oh, I'm going to quit smoking on Friday. Oh, I'm going to do it this time. And then the first little bad thing that happens, they just give up and, and have every excuse in the world. You give yourself your word and you stay committed to yourself like you would anyone else. You deserve that level of respect. Once you can learn to give yourself that amount of respect, I feel like anything's possible. It's amazing how we always give ourselves too much leeway and we are almost always lying to ourselves. It's crazy when you think about it. It's like you would never treat anybody else like this. You wouldn't lie to somebody day in and day out, but you do it to yourself flipping pretty much every day. It's ridiculous. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Once I started kind of putting that concept into play, it, it really changed things and now, when I say I'm not going to smoke marijuana for 2024, like it, it's not even an option. I'm not going to fail. I've given myself my word. I've committed to it. That's all there is to it for me. I know a lot of guys are struggling and think about it all day, every day. And for me, it's just, it's already written. I'm not going to smoke marijuana this year. And that's, that's how it's going to go. Oh, 
I think I think that's been my superpower. And then um, just realizing that all your excuses are lies. It's a Jocko saying. They're all lies. All of them. All of them. <laughs> we tell ourselves all these lies and give ourselves excuses. Stop giving yourself those excuses and the sky's the limit. You definitely uh, chose two of the best guys when it comes to, I guess, motivation and getting your life straight. You know, these two hardcore military blokes in terms of Goggins and, and Jocko. And uh, I think yeah, if anyone wants to sort of get their life straight, then then give the, their books a read because they, they are like extremely helpful. Um, I took so many notes in Goggins' first book. I actually, I actually listened to the book. It was a cool book to listen to uh, because at the end of each chapter, uh, he was interviewed by um, the the guy that uh, actually does the the audio voice for the book, and um, oh. it, it was really cool because they go into certain things a lot deeper, and and I really like that sort of style of an audio book. So so it was really really cool. Um, yeah, I was listening to some clips of yours with JB. I'm good buddies with JB, as I'm sure you know. Um, and he was talking about you know how you got to love it and how you got to have it somewhat play and for me I, I i end up on the other end of the of the doctrine than him i'm i'm about the discipline i don't like going and running i don't like doing that cold shit i do it because it fucking makes me hard and then it makes the rest of my day easy um now i do enjoy running through the forest with my pups but i at least tell myself it's still hard to do <laughs> yeah i guess you have to find what works for you you know um I like what Jordan says about, you know, finding that love for something and it's really cool, but actually, you know, you have to start with the discipline and maybe the love comes like five years down the line. It could, it could, it could take a super long time, you know, but you've just got to use what works for you. I love your, your running story. Uh, you, you mentioned that you promised your dogs that you were going to take them for a walk every day. And that's now led you to basically running with them every day and, you know, doing ultra marathons in the process. I think you've dropped like, I don't know, you said you did weigh 240 pounds at one stage and now you've lost a ton. Um, so yeah, tell us about the, the runs and the dogs and, and all that sort of stuff. When we had our first kid, Jedson, um, I noticed right away our dogs were being neglected. Um, I think, I think most people that are dog owners, if they're being honest with themselves, probably don't walk their dogs enough as is. We were pretty good before we had a kid, but as soon as we had the kid, I realized, oh, these dogs are getting kind of pushed to the side a bit. So I just quit drinking and I needed to have something to keep my mind off of stuff. So one of my goals for that year was to walk the dogs every day. And I downloaded an app called Map My Walk. And every day I did log on and it would give a pop up saying, join this running challenge and run a thousand kilometers in the year. And I couldn't run a kilometer at that point. I was no, every time stop popping up, stop. I hit that thing 40 times, but after, you know, 20, 30 times you start thinking maybe I could run this thing. I hadn't smoked for a year. I just quit drinking, but I just kept hitting ignore and ignore. And finally it eats at you. And you start thinking about it at night. Hmm. Maybe tomorrow I'll start running. So by the end of March, I kind of knew I was going to just join this challenge and attempt it. So one day after work, I went to take my dogs out for a walk. And I just, I was still in my work boots and work clothes. And I said, fuck it. And I hit the accept button and I tried running. And I made it a tenth of a kilometer. And I'm keeled over coughing and I had a little cry at that moment, actually. I, I, I broke down a little bit right there, realizing how pathetic I was at that time. And uh, it was probably one of the most, uh, the biggest moments in my life where I, I could go choose one path or choose the other. And uh, I just said, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to run these 1,000 kilometers this year. I'm going to get my life fucking in order. And I'm going to add fitness into it and some discipline and it's when I started reading Goggins right around that time. And, uh, and yeah, the rest is history. I just, I ran that thousand kilometers that year. I started sharing uh, pictures in the winter of my frosty beard and a couple big accounts seen it and shared it. And then all of a sudden my Twitter blew up and I had all this support and love and 
it was uh it was pretty epic you have the best photos ever um of after those runs because i mean i don't know how cold it is but but it must be bloody freezing whenever you go there but you just you've got this huge huge beard if people are just listening and like you you have like these photos of just like it full of ice and they're like i'm like man that's a cool photo <laughs> i appreciate it yeah people people enjoy it and and your and your dogs but um you you recently lost one of your dogs which is like super sad but you got you got a new one um sarge uh they they just love it do they they just go out with you and they don't mind the snow like no they love it uh as soon as my alarm goes off in the morning they were both always ready we lost lilo um to cancer and she was uh she was the best she ran with us right till the end and uh she was a great dog um we we got another dog just because we've always been a two dog family and we wanted to give another rescue dog a good home so we uh, we mourned her for a couple of weeks, and then uh, last Saturday, my wife said, "Oh, there's some rescue puppies downtown. Maybe we should go. Uh, maybe we should go have a look at them." And uh, we didn't fall in love with any of those ones. But then immediately after, she got on Facebook looking at all the other rescue dogs in town, and one of my childhood friends had a bunch of rescue puppies, and she said, "Oh, I like these ones." So I knew I knew we were going to be getting a puppy soon enough. And that was Saturday. And by Sunday, uh, Sergeant came home with us, so it wasn't a it wasn't a lot, long haul or anything like that. So we're actually taking him out on the running trails for the first time this afternoon. It's been too cold up until today, uh, but it's it's pretty warm out today. It's about minus 15 Celsius, so warm enough to get the puppy out for one little loop. So we're pretty excited to add him to the journey and the story. But warm minus 15 that, that's really really crazy um what is it actually like though like running in snow like that do you have to wear any specific like proper gear or how does it work i don't i wear a pair of sweatpants and a long sleeve shirt and a hoodie and uh i find if you just keep moving you stay warm enough if you stop out there when it's really cold and you don't start moving again you will get hypothermia and you you know, people die out here in the winter. It's it's no joke. It's some days I'm running and it's minus 40, 45 with the windshield. It's uh, my wife won't let me take out the dogs past minus 30. That's the rule. But I keep going. Um, so it's it's no joke. It's sometimes I'll wear a coat on my first lap and then it's just too hot. And my, my trails are right across from my house. So I just throw my coat out and keep running and grab my coat on the way home. But uh I find as long as you keep moving, you're fine. If you if you take a break for too long, low, you're gonna you're gonna freeze up quick. Do you ever like take a step back and think, maybe I'm just wired a little bit differently? Like you know, and and I mean this in a serious way. Like you know, it, it, it's flipping cold minus, never mind minus forty to go for a run. Um, you obviously find the motivation to do that. No worries, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, but then all these other things that you're doing, the the quitting, uh, you know, booze, weed, etc. Do you ever like take a step back and go, she was maybe I'm a, maybe I am wired a little bit differently? Yeah, yeah. Where does it come from? Uh, you know what? I think I think addicts are special people. I think addicts are special people. Um, they get judged a lot but I think they're special people and they've just been misdirected. I think if you take their energy and redirect it to something positive, you'll be amazed at what they can do. Um, my cousin who I'm coaching right now joined my weed challenge and this running challenge with me. And he lives in the same town as me. And uh, he's already ran 250 kilometers this year in two weeks. I haven't even hit 100 kilometers yet. He's 320 pounds. Wow. So we've been talking about it as well. And it's that addictive personality. You just need to set your aim at something better. You know, we were good at drinking beer. We were good at smoking dope. We're going to be good at running. You just have to redirect what you're pointed at and then fucking tackle it. 
I think I don't think I'm special. I think most people can do what I do. Maybe not the cold stuff. It's a little, little too much for most. But um, you just need to be pointed in the right direction sometimes and let loose. I really like that, and and it's, it's noticeable with certain guys that have struggled with addiction that they turn their lives around. You know, they get addicted to something else, but something that's really good. I don't know if you've ever like listened to or heard Rich Roll. Um, you know, he's, he's an American guy. He has one of the biggest podcasts in the world, but he, um, he was also like a big time addict, uh, food and drugs and everything like that. And then, you know, it took him a while to kind of turn things around and he had a couple of slip ups, but now he's like a ultra marathon runner, like, you know, um, huge iron man and all these sort of things and has one of the big, biggest podcasts in the world. And, um, he's, just, he's the same, you know what I mean? Like, um, he's using that. Uh, addiction in the right way which is which is definitely like you said it's you can actually use it positively which is powerful yeah i find addicts are some of the most loyal people that you'll ever meet interesting in what way in like friendship or... well friendship yeah um just just their personality type um, they've been loyal to a drug normally but if you can break them free of what they and redirect them, they're just something about a, a recovering addict who's successful and who's overcame their addiction. They just, some of the best people I've ever met are coming from the addiction space and the recovery space. And I'm, uh, I never really considered myself an addict like some of these people, you know, a lot of people get hooked on heroin and they find themselves losing everything in their lives. And I never really considered myself to be an addict. I was probably addicted to the booze and the cigarettes. And you don't want to call yourself an addict. But I never really considered myself an addict. So I never put that label on myself like others seem to do. Um, but there's, I don't know, just something about the people that overcome all those addictions. They seem to uh, be great people. And they get judged a lot. But... Uh, I think uh, I think there's diamonds in the rough with most of them. Totally agree, and and it's it is, it's that judgment, you know. Like we humans are really bad at that, aren't we? We we look at people and we go, mm, "He's a fucking dick because of whatever," you know. And um, but you never know. Like you you're seeing the tip of that iceberg with a person. You have no clue what they've gone through in life. Like what started that addiction? Like, you know, you just, you just don't know, you know, people don't necessarily speak about these things either. And that's why you, you almost just need to be like extremely kind and compassionate and go, okay, cool. That's your life right now. I'm not here to judge you. I hope you sort it out somehow. And, but it's difficult. Humans don't do that necessarily. Mm -mm. No, no. And I, I'm not, I'm not great at it either. I have a thing called the anti-mentor and I judge people all the time to keep myself focused on what I don't want to be. So I'm not out here trying to, you know, pretend I'm not a judging person. I do it like the rest of us. But I see I see the 40 or 50 year old outside on his smoke break outside and they look like shit and you can tell they smell and they're sitting there smoking outside in their 10 minute break. And I look at that person and I say, that's exactly what I don't want to be. And I call them my anti mentors and uh, that's judging people too. And that's not the best, but it, it helps me to focus on the things I don't want to be. I think it's, it's, What's wrong with that? I don't know if that's a good thing, but it's like, you know, you have to sometimes go, okay, cool. This is what I don't want in life, you know? And there's, there's probably always going to be someone that, that is that person and you go, cool. Well, thank you for teaching me that. And that's just sometimes the, the sort of harshness of life, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, the 50 year old drinking at a bar by himself while his family's somewhere else, you know? the divorced dad who's uh, not at home seven days a week with his kids while another man raises them. Those are people I don't want to be. 100%. But just while we are talking about running, uh, Jordan, he had a question for you. He was like, can you tell us about the rigor mortis trail in North Bay, Ontario? <laughs> oh, man, that was so good. 
Yeah, I went out to uh, learn some drywall skills off of a buddy in Kirkland Lake, Ontario. And uh, JB was three, no, I think he was about six hours away from that. So we met in the middle. We both drove about three hours to North Bay. And uh, we met up and he, at that point, I had never met JB. He was just one of the Twitter buddies. And he was one of the, he definitely the first person I ever met from the, the Twitter friends. So that was a cool experience. And he took me to one of the trails he knew. And beautiful, beautiful trail. Nothing like I've ever ran before, a little bit out of my league, but uh, it was amazing. And then there's a rigor mortis section of this, uh, of the trail, just straight down this hill. And normally I would, you know, kind of tiptoe my way down in my snowshoes and JB just took off flying. I went, all right, I'm going to try to keep up to JB. And so we fucking ran down that hill faster than I've ever ran in my life. And it was, uh, it was probably the most fun I've had on uh, trails and uh, leave it for someone like JB to uh, make you have fun out on those trails. <laughs> That's so cool. But I think it's so awesome that you guys caught up and, uh, I mean, you could be brothers, to be honest with you, just the way you both have these awesome long beards and uh, and love running and are both Canadian. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> these guys were, are definitely soul brothers. And, and uh, maybe in some other life, you you, you were <laughs> real brothers or something like that. But I think it's cool. Yeah, he came and ran my 50K Backyard Ultra with me as well in October. He was uh, in town doing some work with another buddy I had introduced him to he runs our hockey organization here the dry to nice dogs so jb is their official historian i believe is his title and so they were bringing him in to do some documentation on the whole the whole hockey program and so it worked out good we planned it around that and he came and ran i think he ran about 40 kilometers of my 50k with me and then he had to drive four hours and jump on an airplane to get home that day so uh man i appreciated having him out on the trails and help help guiding me i'd never really attempted something that big before and he has a bit more experience so it was really cool for him to come uh come down and do that 50k and he got to meet my family and uh it made it made it that much more special yeah wow that's cool man that's nice a nice transition from like this online digital buddy to to a real buddy and now probably lifelong friends which is which is amazing but i was wondering um what 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 is it that you kind of are most excited about like now for the future jeremy short term i'm really excited to go run this ultra marathon down in indy in the indianapolis uh we're doing i think it's called the prairie on fire there's 15 or 20 of us twitter friends so it's kind of taking that connection that i made with jb and just blowing it up with all these other people. Um, just lots of people that I've really respected online and looked up to while I'm trying to get my shit together. And so I'll be excited to meet a lot of those guys down there and do that one. I'm looking forward to that, but um, I'm qu quickly leaning into this uh, uh, leading guys on this weed free. And I don't know if it's only just going to be weed free. I I've really enjoyed helping, helping people in general. So um somewhat to the coaching aspect of things or, or being a leader of some sort um, more than just um, leading by example. I kind of want to take the bull by the horns and, uh, and see how far I can take it. And uh, I'm looking at doing some winter retreats with guys, pushing them to the next level, uh, letting people experience the whole, uh, the shiver land and get cold, do cold things. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to see how far I can take the whole Shiver King brand and, and go from there. Mm, that's super exciting. That's super exciting, man. And I think it's, it feels like this almost natural evolution, you know, for you going to do something like that, you know, you, you started off leading through action, uh, you are now inspiring other guys, you've done what other people want to do. So you've got almost this kind of like tank of knowledge which you can share and tools and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, the coaching elements would would just fit in there perfectly. So, you know, well done for transforming your life and now gonna hopefully and definitely I would say transform many other guys' lives. So that's that's really that's really epic. But um my last question is uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> What does being ridiculously human mean to me? Um, 
just making the most of the time we have here. I don't care what you're going to do. Just be able to look back and be happy with what you did do, whether it be running ultra marathons or just being in your community, helping out, um, just, just being proud of the person you are and uh, representing your true self. Jeremy, but I just wanted to say like, what a top man you are seriously. Like it's been an absolute pleasure just watching your evolution and the changes that you you've done online, you know, like I've, I've never met you, of course, you know, but I just, I really find you like yeah, an inspire. Yeah. Yep, exactly. There you go. But I find you super inspiring and like extremely knowledgeable, but like, and, um, wise too you know like you've 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 done stuff that uh that other people want to do and just listening to you speak now like i'm like yes man this guy is gonna flip and go places you know like it's it was it was funny recently right you've been writing about meeting jordan peterson either in the gulags or on his podcast and i was like well there's good opportunity for both but <laughs> um, we'll um, see how this world turns out eh? it's, it's pretty crazy Exactly. But, but, you know, there, there's, there's things that we haven't even sort of touched on, which has been like, you know, how you've uh, started your own business recently, like, and, and quit who you're working for, you've retired your wife, you know, and like that, these are like huge, awesome goals, you know, you're writing children's books, there's, there's so much to you as a man, that I think is great for other men to look up to, you know, so I seriously, but I just want to say thanks so much for sharing everything that you do online and sharing it now on the podcast and just keep being that legend, but it's been, it's been really cool. And, and thank you very much. You're, you're way too kind. I, uh, leaving me a bit speechless, but, uh, that means a lot to me, man, more than, you know. <laughs>